We're in our final week of this Healthy Life series and it's been incredible. As we look at what does it really look like to be a Christian or to open God's word and approach holistic health. And we talk about spiritual health, relational health, financial health, physical health, and it's been incredible. But now what? What do we, what's the next step for all that we're learning? Let me ask you a question, what do you love to do? Because chances are, if you love to do that thing, you're already doing it. My, my hope is that you would continue to do that, but don't just do it alone. And don't do that thing, whether it's hiking or biking or scrapbooking or paddleboarding or pickleball. Don't do it with just Christians. Allow the gospel to compel you to reach those in your community that don't go to church or that are far from God. That's what communities is. And so this is an opportunity to get involved and allow your passion, what you love to do, to meet and know others amongst the community. So as you meet and know them, hopefully as you rub shoulders with them, they can meet and know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. My community group is basketball, and I'm excited to bring it to you because this is what my first passion was. Connecting passion and purpose and putting God at the center of it is everything this group is about. The fellowship by connecting with other people. And when we can put that with physical activity, especially outdoors, it's transforming. Uh, that's what that's what excites me about uh, fitness is getting out there together uh, with, with other people and sharing in that fitness because uh, I certainly am not doing it all by myself. Even though this was originally started to help our body, uh, uh, you know, church family with meals, I think that with enough helping hands, we could extend that out. You know, whether it be leadership or, or other areas of interest, it's just great opportunities to grow. So let's get out there, let's continue to do it. If you got questions, come talk to me, sign up, check out our website. Let's go and be godly community in the community for the sake of the gospel. It's kind of interesting, Pastor Nate's a guy of faith and last week we were just starting to kind of introduce sort of the tip of the iceberg of what God's gonna do through communities here at Shoreline Church. And he said he was gonna have, he was having faith and praying that like 50 to 70 people would sign up for something and express interest because in our world today people don't sign up for stuff very much. And, over 210 people last week already said, I want to know more about this. And that's just starting with a handful of our community groups. Pastor Nate actually said, I think that by the end of the year, we're going to have 50 to 60 different community groups where people gather who are followers of Jesus and learning about Jesus, and they have just do life together and share life, doing what they enjoy. And within that, there can be connections and ways to, to grow in faith, share relationship, and have fun together. And so some of you think, well, like, what kind of community groups are we going to have? And here's my answer. We don't know. It's going to depend on what you like to do and what you come to Pastor Nate and say, somebody's going to come and say, hey, can we do like a science fiction book reading club? And can we make that a community group? Well, I'm thinking, well, yeah, let's, let's figure that out. Let's see what that looks like. When I came to my church in Michigan, I was at for 14 years, they actually had a, a community group of quilters. They've been quilting for a lot of years. And one of my first weeks, I was wandering around the church campus and I walked in this one room and there was like 15, 20 uh, women ranging from their 20s to their 80s quilting. And they would take these quilts and send them to missionaries and to hospitals that needed gifts for children. It was an amazing way to hang out together, have fun, and do something that had purpose. And I still remember my button on my pants had, had broken and, I, and I'm not a really sewer, so I said, well, now, could you, could you guys, you guys have all these sewing machines and stuff, could somebody fix this? So one of the women says, oh, just go stand behind that pile of quilts Take your pants off, throw them over to us. We'll fix the button, and then we'll throw them back to you. That's what she said. I said, I said no way. So my, my first week at a new church, I could see the Grand Rapids Press article. You know, pastor caught with pants down with 14 church. Where, you know, I'm, I'm like, so I went back to my office, and I sent the, the pants over, and they came back with the button fixed. So there's lots of things that happen in communities. Um, but, but we're going to see God do amazing things. And here's the reality. As we walk through this, finish this series on a healthy life, our faith fits into everything. Every part of our lives should be touched by our faith and our faith should weave into every part of life. So whatever we do, God's present, God's doing things. And we've been talking over these weeks about just understanding, God, I wanna have a healthy life that honors you. I wanna have a healthy mind, a mind that thinks the thoughts of Christ and that thinks the way it should. I wanna have healthy relationships because that honors God. So we talked about growing our relational world. Two weeks ago, Pastor Keith talked about healthy finances and how we can honor God by the way we handle our resources. And that's critical, that's important. Last week, Pastor Sean talked about, about, having, uh, about having healthy bodies and just saying, God, I wanna honor you with my physical body. I have one body for one lifetime. God, how can I honor you? And it was fun for me to be able to, in one of the case out of the country, follow the sermon, in another case right here in Monterey, follow the sermon. 
and, and, and just to learn from our team of pastors. Now, I have to let you know, even though Pastor Sean did a great job and Pastor Keith did a great job, I looked at my schedule. I'm preaching 12 of the next 13 sermons here, so you're going to get sick of me. Uh, but uh, but I, it was so, so great to have a team of preachers that can come and open the word and challenge us to grow lives that honor Jesus. And today we're talking about growing a healthy spiritual life. And can I be honest? This is the area that tends to get missed in many of our lives. You know, we can measure our health. Oh, my cholesterol is this, and my blood pressure is this, and I stand on the scale, and it's that. And there's, you know, you get all these numbers and ways to measure different parts of our health. But when it comes to our spiritual lives, you say to somebody, well, hey, how are you doing in your walk with Jesus? How's your spiritual life? And it's kind of like, um, yeah, pretty good, I guess. I mean, I go to church, and I own a Bible, and I, uh, you know, I give a little money. I mean, we go, well, how do I, how do I know? Is there a way to measure how I'm doing spiritually more than just Okay, I guess. And we believe the answer is yes. In the coming weeks, we're going to look together. We're kind, of, we're kind of kicking off a theme today of a healthy spiritual life. But in the coming weeks, we're going to dig into that topic. And we're going to give you skills and tools and ways to measure and say, how am I really doing in my spiritual life? And if, if you say, I want to go deeper in love with Jesus. I want to go deeper in my faith. How do I do that? That's what we're going to focus on. And I look at today as kind of like if you're wandering around Costco and they have a little sample. You know, they give you a little sample. What do they want you to do? They want you to buy a box of that stuff, right? Or at Costco, a case or a truckload. And so, um, you know, but they give you a little taste and say, well, boy, I like that. I hope that today you listen and you say, maybe you're a new believer, a longtime Christian, and you say, man, I want to go deeper in my spiritual life. I want to love Jesus more and live for him with greater passion. I hope that's your desire. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I hope you say, I want to know this Jesus. I want to have a spiritual life. I want to have more than just my physical life. I want to know the God who made me, the God who loves me. Wherever you are on your journey, today we're kind of kicking off into a next chapter of our spiritual lives. And here's what I believe for many of you. For many of you, you're going to say, I want to go deeper in my spiritual life than I've ever gone before. I think some of you are going to look at these these coming weeks. You're going to look back in a year, five years, ten years, and say, my life changed because I just made a decision to go deeper in my spiritual life because it matters that much to me. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Ephesians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And, and if you don't, we'll have them up on the screen here. But in, in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, this leader in the early church almost 2,000 years ago, is writing this church in the city of Ephesus. It's kind of this cultural center. And he's addressing this topic of the importance of spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. If you have your own Bible and something to write with, I encourage you to highlight or underline or circle <clears throat> all the things that jump out about going mature or going deeper in your, in your relationship with Jesus. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, these are leaders, to equip his people, that's the church, all Christians, to equip his people for works of service. So the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And then this next line blows my mind. Listen to this. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal of maturity. I mean, let me read that again. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You never become Jesus. There's only one Jesus. Jesus. But we can become way more like Jesus than we are today. Amen? Amen? And that's the heart of God. That's the desire of God. So then he goes on in verse 14. As this happens, then we will no longer be spiritual babies, infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. You're going to have discernment. You're going to understand truth. You're not going to be blown around by every new idea. But you go, oh, I know where I stand. I know what I believe. Verse 15, and here it comes again. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body, church, God's people, of him who is the head, that is Christ. Do you get the picture? That's the heart of God for you. Whether you've become a Christian or not, he wants you to know Jesus and then grow into maturity. And if you're a Christian, whether you've been a Christian for seven days, seven weeks, or 70 years, he says, there's more of God for you to know. There's more intimacy with God. There's more growth. And my hope and prayer is that you will say, I want to grow in my journey with Jesus. I'm not going to be content with just a little bit. I want more and more of God's presence and power and goodness. And that's where we're going to be going in the weeks ahead. So for today, 
I'm going to share with you seven different, just kind of little samples, little tastes of things that, that I hope you'll look and say, I want that more in my life. I want to go deeper in that. And my hope is that you take at least one or two of these today and say, I'm going to take a step forward in that starting today. I mean, I really want to start growing in my spiritual life. So here's the first one. If you're a note taker, there's a place in your bulletin to write down these seven things. If you can, got a great memory, lock them in your brain. But uh, if you want to write them down, you can. Number one. Embrace and live in the amazing grace of Jesus. You want to go deeper in your faith. You walk every day holding to and embracing a profound awareness that the grace of Jesus is still truly amazing. We sang amazing grace. We sang about God's reckless love. Not that God is a reckless God, but the way he loves us from our standpoint, it's like, why would you love me like that? Why would you do that, God? It seems over the top. It seems out of control. It just seems, it doesn't make sense because it's so amazing and so great. One person years ago, I heard this, and, and I don't know actually who said it first, but they said, let me, they, they said, let, we'll describe grace this way. They use an acronym of grace, G-R-A-C-E. And they say, here's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. You get all of God's riches and all of God's goodness at the price of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. He offers all of that to you. The Apostle Paul, a little earlier in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, says this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast that you understand the gift of God's grace. You couldn't earn it. You couldn't deserve it. He gives it. And boy, if you can walk in that understanding, it's life changing. I keep a water bottle, an empty water bottle on my bookshelf in my home, in my office at home. It's been there for five years since my 50th birthday. This is the water bottle. It's the fanciest water bottle I've ever seen. It's made of thick, nice glass with a really good plastic top on it. And I keep it there for this simple reason. This reminds me of the grace of God. And you say, how's that work? Let me tell you. On my 50th birthday, four couples who are dear friends of ours uh, gave me a gift on my 50th birthday. They sent me away to the most beautiful, fancy hotel that I have ever gone to and probably ever will go to. And they paid for it. And because I'm a good guy, I took my wife along. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, for my 50th birthday, I, I, we got to go, to, it, it's along the California coast. It's kind of like, like built into the cliffs above the ocean, looking over the ocean and the redwoods. It's just ridiculous. And I, could, I, would, I couldn't afford to go to a place like that on my own, but they paid the price. And they sent me. And when I got there, the water bottles, I took one. I don't know if they refill them or not, but they're not going to refill this one. Um, but the water bottles were like this. And, and, and it was just amazing. And, and they had these big, fluffy robes you got to wear. So we walk around in our big, fluffy robes. I think when we were done, they washed them and let somebody else use them too. But anyways, that's aside from the point. They had these really nice robes. And, and we, we'd, Sherry and I would walk around there for these 48 hours, two days, and just be like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> we, we wouldn't do this. Somebody paid for us to experience this. We sat in one of the two infinity pools that look out over the ocean and appears to go on forever. You know? and, just, and nobody else was there in that infinity. Which, and it's just like we sat in this restaurant that's kind of set on the, over the edge of the cliffs and watched the sunset. We're like, this is ridiculous. This is grace. Someone else paid the price. We didn't deserve it. I turned 50. That's, you know, just, all you got to do is stay alive. You get there. It wasn't like I didn't do anything really. But they gave this amazing gift. I keep this bottle on the shelf in my study at home because it reminds me that for two days I got to experience an amazing place. But it pales in comparison to the grace I experience every single day for the last 40 years since I met Jesus. And every day, you know, these, these bottles run out. He gives me living water every day and fills me and quenches the, the driest, thirstiest moments of my life. I had to leave the robe there that they gave, but Jesus wraps me in the robe of his righteousness and calls me his own and calls me his child. And the ocean of his grace and goodness is an infinite ocean. It's, I, th those two days gave me this little taste. It's like, again, like a Costco sampler. Like I get a little taste. 
But what I experience in Jesus Christ and his grace is every day of my life and for eternity. Someone say amen. amen. That's the grace of God. We get tastes in this life, but what he has stored up for us is beyond our comprehension. And so make a decision as a follower of Jesus. If you want to grow in your faith, live each day to say, God, your grace is still amazing. And Christ's presence is still powerful. Number two, partake of a consistent diet of scripture. You want to grow in your spiritual life. And we'll dig more into this in the weeks to come as we look at growing as a strong, healthy spiritual life. But open this book and dig into this book and let God speak to you. I love what the apostle Paul says to this young pastor, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he says this about the word of God, about the Bible. All scripture is God-breathed. That God breathed by his spirit the very truth of scripture. And is useful, listen to this. Here's what the Bible does. Some of what the Bible does. For teaching, rebuking, hmm, correcting, and training in righteousness. Training. It's not like a little challenging stuff there. So that the servant of God, you and I, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I think the problem with the Bible for most people, and the way a lot of people don't read the Bible, is not that they don't understand it. It's that it's really clear. And it challenges us. It teaches us. It convicts us. It rebukes us. It corrects us. But we need that if we want to grow spiritually. Sherry and I made a kind of fun decision in January to do something together we'd never done together before. We had surgeries together. It was great. It was so much fun. <laughs> and um, not the same surgery, not in the same medical center, but I had, uh, I had a doctor who really kindly cut out a big portion of the inside of my ear, took the skin, threw it away because it had a not bad kill you cancer, but called basal cell, and then take a big chunk of my face right here, cut it out and sew that with 32 sutures into my inner ear, and then sew my face up. You know, so that was cool. And um, if you want to see my ear later, it's amazing. Um, but, uh, and Sherry had doctors going like here, here, and here, and then open up here and do five different procedures on her shoulder. So if, if you get near Sherry today and you hug her, she'll scream in pain. But you can say hi and wave at her. But, um, so we both had these surgeries within about a week and a half of each other. And we thanked, we paid the doctors to do it. Yeah. And we thanked them. Thank you for cutting up my ear. Thank you for poking holes in my arm, right? Why? Because the work, they told Sherry, you have 100% mobility and strength back in your arm. They told me, your ear's going to be fine. I said, what? No. Um, but uh, they, they, they told me, they said, and if you want to look at my ear after, you can come look at my ear after church. It's all, it's healing up amazing. This book right here, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You know what will change me and make me more like Jesus? This book. Amen. And there's times it corrects, there's times it rebukes. There's times that God shows me stuff in me that's got to, like cancer, it's got to be cut out and thrown away. And I will not see it and I will not change if I don't come under the teaching of God's word. That's right. And so I thank God for the times. And there's times I read the Bible and it just blesses and warms me and it's like sweet as honey. It's woo, that's great. There's times like that too. But sometimes it just, it just does surgery around me. But I want to become more like Jesus, so I'm going to stay in the word. And I hope you can commit to that in your own spiritual journey as well. Number three, make a relentless commitment to thankfulness. Just commit yourself to be thankful for God's goodness because God has been good. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there's these two little short verses then a longer verse. Here's the two short ones. Verse 16, rejoice always. It's a great verse to memorize. Rejoice always. 17, pray continually. And 18, give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say for all circumstances. It says in Sometimes hard things happen, and, I, and God doesn't say, hey, thank me for the hard thing, but we can thank God in the hard thing because he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. And, and so become a person of thankfulness for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Will you make a decision in your mind and a commitment in your heart and a lifestyle with your lips of saying, thank you, God, you've been good. And thank you for the people around me who've been good to me too because you pour your goodness through those people. Become a relentlessly committed, thankful person, and you will grow in your spiritual life. That's part of our journey. Number four, grow a consistent discipline of confession and repentance. A consistent discipline of confession and repentance. Learn that part of the spiritual journey is telling God, God, I confess when I've messed up, and I turn around, and I will follow you better. And part of our spiritual journey is looking at other people and saying, I'm sorry, I messed up, that was my fault. 
I said I'd never do that again. I did it again. I am so sorry. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to turn around and try my best in God's power to live differently. You want to grow as a Christian? You want a little sample, a little taste of what part of that is? It's learning to confess to God and to others when you mess up. In 1 John chapter 1, we read these words, words beginning in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, never did anything wrong, not me, I'm perfect, right? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, and listen to this, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Wow. That's God's grace. That's God's goodness. And then he says this. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him, God, out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. Well, why does that make God a liar? Because God has said all of us have sinned. We've all messed up. Now, I've never met anybody that I talked to and had an honest conversation. And if I said to them, anybody who, you know, not a Christian at all, didn't go to church with my background, no background in church, no faith. I've never met anybody who I've said, you know, if there is a perfect God, would he look at your life and say, all you've said, thought, and done is perfect? I've never, never met anybody who said, yep. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, of course not. I mean, every day. We think things we shouldn't think and say things we shouldn't say with, that, with a tone, with an edge. God didn't mean to say it that way and we see how it hurts someone. But when we confess our sins, boy, if you want, if you want to become a Christian and follow Jesus, it starts there. God's love is amazing, but I have to confess my sins. And if you are a Christian, you stay in a journey of learning what it looks like to be honest and confess, God, I, I, did, I did it again. I'm so sorry. I am sorry. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to keep following Jesus. It's an ongoing journey of confessing and repenting. Even though we're forgiven in Christ when we become Christians, we still have to confess when we mess up, and that, that just gives us strength to press on. Number five, Sabbath well. I wish I could spend the whole morning just teaching on this because it's such a powerful topic. But learn to Sabbath well. One of the Ten Commandments says this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. I love that God in his top ten list, one of the things he said is, you got to rest. Yeah. Dial back. You were not made to work seven days in a row, week after week after week after week. It destroys your body, your soul, your relationships. And so God said, in a rhythm of life, every seven days, you take a 24-hour period, and you just step back from a lot of that stuff. For me, I turn off my phone for the most part. I turn off my church account stuff, so I'm not looking at that. You say, you mean you're not available seven days a week? No, but guess what? God is. You'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but but one, day, one day a week, I, one day a week, I, I unplug. I spend a little more time with Jesus. I, I do some things that are just fun that I like to do that are relaxing. I don't set my alarm in the morning. And, 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 and here's the thing. The way God has made me, I am, it's like God wound me up when, I, when he made me and like just kept winding. And just, you know, I don't drink, I don't drink caffeine I don't drink coffee, I don't do caffeine, I don't do drugs, I'm just wound up. And I just go. And so, and my, my wife, is this true? All the time, right? And you love it. Yeah, she, she was going. <laughs> but that's the way God's made me. But, but listen closely, one day out of seven, I battle for this. I strive for it. This last week, I couldn't do a 24-hour period like one day, so I did noon one day to noon the next day. That's all I could do. But, but, I, but, but, but the ancient Jews actually did it sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So you can overlap, right? But, but that, and when Sherry and I had, when our boys were like one, three, and five, and we were in school and working full time and life was crazy, we were like, how do we figure out? And we strive, we're striving together to find a way that she could get Sabbath because raising kids, she'd be like, well, I need time without the kids. We, we, we work to find that rhythm because God says, I've not made you for endless labor. I've made you to work hard, yes, but also to rest well and recharge your batteries. Maybe that's an area that you look and say in these coming weeks as we talk together, maybe I need to grow in a rhythm of working hard but also resting well and letting God recharge my soul. Number six, notice God's presence and listen for his whispers. You want to grow in your faith? Understand God is with you. He is near all the time. And just start to listen for him to speak because God is speaking. The problem is we're so stinking loud and we go so fast, and we keep so many things turned on and plugged in that I don't think it's quiet enough for us to actually hear. God is sometimes whispering, and we're just kind of got stuff playing over the top of it. And we need to kind of disconnect and, and step back from some of that. I love the story in 1 Kings 19. You may know it. It might be new to some of you. But Elijah, the prophet, has gone through a really challenging time. He's off alone. He's in this cave up in the mountains, and God wants to speak to him, so God calls him to step out. 
Verse 11, 1 Kings 19, the Lord said, go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So he's thinking, okay, God's gonna come in some amazing, spectacular way. So what happens? A great and powerful wind whoosh, tore through the mountains apart, tore them apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord. But listen to this. But the Lord was not in the wind. Like, yeah, you thought that'd be the God thing, right? After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, wildfire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. God began to speak quietly. You want to grow in your faith. And in these coming weeks, as we walk through this together, say, God, I need to be quiet enough to hear when you're whispering quietly to me. Boy, reach out and love that person, God says, but we don't hear it. Stop and help that person, God says, but we're going too fast. Don't speak to your spouse that way. I love them more than that, and so should you, but we don't hear it because we're yelling. Find quiet places. This is gonna be part of our journey. How do I grow in my faith? And then number seven, invest your hours and days in things that have eternal weight. Invest your life, invest your hours, invest your days in things that last forever. And there's so many things we spend so much time on that are just like, they're like zero on the it matters for eternity scale. And yet we put so much time into those things. Now, it's not that that's not part of our life. And, and, but, but God says, you know, what are the two big things in all the universe? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Worship of God, love of people. Those are the things that last forever. So start to look at your life and say, God, where am I putting a lot of time into things that don't have a big eternal impact? And how can I kind of reorganize and rethink my life? I want to ask you this morning, to look at where you are on your spiritual journey. And I want to talk to two different groups of people. I want to talk first to people that have already put their faith in Jesus and then to people who have not yet put their faith in Jesus. So I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable doing so, just to kind of quiet your heart and just bow your heart before the Lord. And I want to ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come and put your faith in Him, whether it was a week ago or 70 years ago, I want to ask you this question. Do you want to grow deeper in your faith? Do you want to know him more? Do you want to understand his grace more fully? Do you want to learn to be more thankful? Do you want to confess more quickly and more fully and just be able to move on with your life? Do you want to grow in your journey with Jesus? I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you, if you say right now, as we get ready for, to walk into this series about how do we grow in our spiritual journey with Jesus, if you say right now, I want to go deeper. I want more of God. I want to hear God speak more clearly. I want to see Jesus' face more powerfully. If you say, I want to grow in my faith, I want you to do this. I want you to raise your hand high. And I'm raising my hand, not as an example, I'm raising it because that's, I want that for me. So hey, raise your hand high and then just look up at me. And I want to just kind of look across the worship center and just to see, praise God. And just hold your hand high and just say, God, I want, I want to know you more. I want to grow in my faith. I want to go deeper. And just pray this with me. Oh God, we say right now, our hand lifted before you and our hearts lifted up, God, we want to know you more. We want to see your face. We want to know your love. We need to know your love more, God. We need to be amazed by your grace again. And so we, we say for these coming weeks, we want to be here and be together and learn and grow and go deeper in our faith than we've ever gone before. We want to love Jesus more than we've ever loved him before. We want to share his grace with others with more boldness than we ever have before. We want to hear your word through scripture and by your still small voice more than we ever have before. So Lord, we pray that these coming weeks will be a life transforming journey for us. We give ourselves to you and we say, teach us, Lord. We're ready to learn, we're ready to grow. If that's your prayer, say amen. 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 Let's just keep our heads bowed in a place of prayer. And I want to talk to one more group. If you're here this morning and you've never come to that place where you've said to Jesus for the first time, I want to be your follower. Maybe you've been in church a lot. Maybe you've been around church a lot. But you, 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 you don't know for certain that you've said, Jesus, I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. I want to be your young person. And you want to pray today to receive Jesus, to come and confess your wrongs and say, Jesus, fill me with your grace and begin to work in my life. If that's you today, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to raise your hand high right now. I want you to, then I want you to look right up at me. And I want to actually, when you look at me, I want to say, okay, when I pray, I'm going to pray for you, okay? Not at me, right? Okay. Right back there along the wall. Okay, can you see me? Nod your head. Okay, I'm going to pray for you. 
Anybody else? Okay, way up in the balcony. Good, all right. I wanna pray with you. Oh, right here in the balcony. I wanna pray with you. Good, thank you. Okay, right here. All right, fantastic. I wanna pray with you. Anybody else? Over here on this side. Yep, okay. Oh, right there. Yep, good. I'm gonna put you... Okay. I just look at anybody on this side. I've been looking at one side here. Okay, right there. Good. All right, I want to pray with you. And way up near the top there, I can see you. Right in the white top. Good. I pray with you. Anybody else? Just raise it. Okay, right all along the wall. Good. I want to pray with you. Okay. So, okay, right here. Okay, great. Fantastic. All right, so if you raised your hand, will you just in your heart right now, and if I didn't see your hand, God sees it. Pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today, and I don't have all the answers, and I don't have it all figured out. But Jesus, I confess I need you. Will you forgive me for all of my wrongs, for all of my sins? Past, present, and future, Jesus, forgive me because you died on the cross and you rose again to pay the price for me. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love and your grace. And now I pray, fill me, strengthen me, grow in me. Help me follow you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, Jesus, thank you for each of these people. And I want to say right now, if you're in the family worship venue, in the family worship venue, would you look up right now and raise your hand if you prayed that prayer? And Pastor Nate's right up front there. He wants to see your hand. Just look right up at Pastor Nate. And if you're online, would you go online right now? And Pastor Ben is waiting to interact with you online after the service and just talk with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your amazing grace. A love that from a human standpoint seems mind-boggling. It seems reckless and absurd that you would seek us out and love us and send your only son, but we give you praise for this truth and this grace.